I was born in a small town in Poland called Sherad. Well, like you, I had a secure home, many friends, had started at a good school and looked forward to my own future with great optimism. But in 1939, when Hitler army invaded Poland, all that was to change and my life was never the same again. It marked the start of a life very different from the one I had imagined. And for the following 30 years, my life was one big uphill struggle. Let me tell you, and then perhaps you will understand even more clearly why I must tell every, take every opportunity in your life in future and make the very best of every chance you have for developing your life in a fruitful and positive way. When I was just 11 years old, I was forcibly taken from my hometown in Sherat, taken to a work camp. Some people con called them concentration camps at a place called Otochna that was near the big city of Poznan, Western Poland. The conditions were horrendous. Starvation was a continuous terrible ordeal. We worked for 14 hours a day, building a railway line to help the German war effort. There were ceaseless, brutal beatings. The work was very hard. I had witnessed young men of no more than 20 years old of age being hanged for absolutely no reason at all. And I then had to cut them down and help to bury them in a clearing in a nearby wood. I had no one to care for me. And there I was, an 11 years old boy, miles away from home, surviving these terrible conditions I could tell you more about the suffering at a dreadful place, but all I can say is that I had to endure this for over 18 months. It was only through a huge bit of luck that I was sent back home to Sherad. Of the 2,500 youngsters in the camp, only 11 survived, and I was one of them. So there I was now 13 years old, back home in Sherat, but only a few months later, in the middle of 1942, all these Jews of Sherat and the neighbor town and villages were rounded up, 4,000 of us, and packed into the town church, awaiting our fate. This was part of a program of an creation of the Jews of Poland, which the Nazis had planned at the Wannsee Conference in January 1942. In the church, there, were, there was no food, no water, no sanitation, no toilet. Everybody was very thirsty and hungry. I volunteered to go outside and plead for a pan of water from the SS guard. He asked me what was my profession. I quickly answered Schneider, a tailor, meaning I was a tailor. I wasn't a tailor at all, of course, but I had enough experience of these people to know that if I had something that I might have helped them, then I was more likely to get what I wanted. I was quickly taken away to join a work party assembling in the square. That was the last time I saw my parents, and grandparents, my brothers and sisters. I learned later that every next day and everyone else in the church were all taken to an extermination camp not very far away called Chelno, a cut out in the forest and gassed there and murdered in three mass graves. 265,000 people are buried in the three mass graves. They had done nothing wrong. They were not soldiers or connected with the army, but they were murdered simply only because they were Jews. I had survived, but even now, every time I visit the site which was Chelmno, 
I think of my parents, my family, and relive those events as it were only yesterday. So a little later, at the age of 13, by now, I found myself in the ghetto of Lodge. Lodge was a city similar to Manchester, textile mills. And every much like Manchester, and that it was also a textile manufacturing city. I had now lost all my family, had nothing but the clothes I stood up in, no support or love, and I was on my own forced to fend for myself in a war-torn country. The ghetto which the Jews were forced to live was surrounded by guards and their dogs, and in many areas with wire fence. There were only very few gates. It was very difficult to get in or out. The ghetto was very crowded. There was never enough food, water, or clothing. or places which people could live, large families having to live together in one room, sharing basic facilities with many other people. It was very cold in the winter, and I was always hungry. People were dying at an alarming rate. Every day their bodies were loaded onto a cart and taken away for burial at the local cemetery. Somehow I managed to stay alive, always hungry, and my bones were started to protrude from my skin until I started to look like a skeleton. But by good fortune, as I walked the streets, another boy told me about an orphanage in which he lived, where there was shelter and where Little, little more food and kindness from the people who looked after us. I had to work, of course, but the orphanage was a, a real lifeline and enabled me to survive the harsh condition in the ghetto. One day the Germans made the decision to close the ghetto and transport all of who had managed to stay alive to be what they called resettled in the East somewhere. There we were promised a better life with warmth, food, clothing, and useful work. All the children in the orphanage, there were 185 of us. First of all, we walked out of the ghetto, after which we were loaded onto lorries and taken to the station in Lodge. Here we were packed into cattle wagons with barely enough room in which to stand, let alone sit, with little light or ventilation, after what seemed to be eternity, after a death rural journey, packed tight and st with strangers, with no food or water, no idea where we were going, we arrived at our destination. That was Auschwitz extermination camp in the south of Poland. This was the beginning of an even worse period in my life, where I had to learn a complete new way of living and trying to survive. How I managed to survive those five months in Auschwitz, I shall never know. I was still only 14 years gone for 15, hungry and cold every day, having to get up five in the morning for a roll call which could last several hours, go off to work, come back to the camp only when it started to get dark. Have to endure yet, another roll call and then grab a few hours of sleep, crammed in a wooden bank with eight or nine people come together before and the whole routine started again in the next day. I had to witness punishment, hangings, suffered several beatings during my time there, and experienced hunger and other horrors that almost drained me of the will to live. But they were never able to take away completely my will to live. I never gave up, even in the face of dreadful 
adversity and suffering determined to survive and to tell the world about what happened in places like Auschwitz. However unbelievable it was, even towards the end of the war, in January 1945, when the Germans were close to total defeat, there was no end to the torture which they inflicted on the men, women, and other children who were still, by some miracle, still alive. As the Russian army moved west, overcoming little German resistance, we were one day taken from our barracks from Auschwitz, starting to walking, walking, walking away from Auschwitz. And anybody that could not walk was shot in the back of the head. <clears throat> I had a pair of clogs, and that I had to uh, walk in the snow, uh, minus 25 degrees, with practically no food, no shelter from the cold. I was part of one of the death marches away from concentration camps or all, the, all over Europe. The Germans faced defeat. We had no idea where we were going. And indeed, there seemed to be no absolutely no purpose or the direction where we were walking. After several days walking, we arrived in a town. And then we were loaded onto a, a train, a goods train. And then we were taken for th three days, and we arrived in Germany, East Germany, uh, in a place called Weimar. Our eight kilometers away from Weimar was a, a concentration camp called Buchenwald. My third experiences of living in solid condition we once more were degraded into living like animals and being treated like worse than animals by the German guards. It was now February 1945, and with no increasing number of American and British planes flying overhead, I thought it could not last long before we were liberated. But February passed, as did March and, and April, and we were headed one day. Our um, barrack was called out, and um, we're going to be evacuated to another place. And we were taken to Weimar, um, that was eight kilometers away, and we were taken to a railway station and loaded onto. A, ra a railway, no roofs, on open wagons, and we were taken away for the whole month. We were taken from south to west and so on for the whole month on open wagons. We started with 3,000 people. We arrived in Czechoslovakia on the 4th of May, 1945, 600. People were dying every day. I've seen cannibalism. We used to eat grass because um, they gave us no food. So we had grass. I even bent my shoe to try to eat my shoe. It's just unbelievable what happened. And 600 of us arrived in Czechoslovakia on the 4th of May, 1945 and our train was taken into Terezin, and there we were liberated four days later on the 8th of May, 1945, and I did survive. I lost 80 for my family, cousins, uncles, brothers, sisters, everybody. And, and then the British, after we were liberated, a lot of typhoid and all sorts of diseases were on. The Russian army didn't know where where to turn, but they helped us wherever they could. They gave us rice pudding every day because our stomachs couldn't take any food. Uh, and for two weeks, they gave us rice pudding. And, um, and about three months after the war, we children were separated, living in three different buildings. 
and uh, the British consul arrived, looked us over, and those which were fit were taken the names, and those which were ill went to a sanatorium, and 300 children were chosen, 40 girls and 260 boys, and we went to Prague to the uh, airport. There waited 10 Lancaster bombers, and they loaded us on 30 children to a bomber. We sat on the floor, on both sides of the floor, and after eight hours, we arrived here in Carlisle. There was an airport base here, and we arrived, and um, so we arrived, um, we were unloaded, and then the buses were waiting for us, and they took us outside Windermere uh, in the Lake District because they were making aeroplanes there, and the war was finished just, and we took the houses of the people who lived uh, making the aeroplanes. We each had a room, a bed, a chest of drawers, and, and um, we, uh, because all the workers used to have, each one had a room, and uh, we had a main hall for food to eat, and also they showed us films in English, but we couldn't understand. We had seven hours of English lessons in the Lake District, and that's all we had. We had to go to libraries and make words up and so on, and that's how I learned English. And after six months being in Windermere, the lakes, the mountains, it was wonderful. And um, then after six months, they, start, they send us, they send me with 20 boys to Liverpool. We were in Liverpool for eight months. Manchester took 30 boys, London took 120, Glasgow took some children as well, and that's how we came to this country. Um, unfortunately, after about two months, the Red Cross lady came, and uh, we gave our names uh, from our parents and brothers and sisters, and uh, they looked for people, but they couldn't find anybody. And she told us, it's very, very sorry, we can't find anybody from your family. And um, afterwards, we, after the six months, after the eight months of being in Liverpool, we were joined up with the Manchester boys. And um, that's how I basically, we went to live with people in lodgings, and it uh, wasn't the best thing for us, but unfortunately, that was that, and um, eventually I, I uh, went to train as an electrician, and then as an auto electrician, and um, that's how my life went. got uh, married, and I had three daughters, and I've got seven grandchildren today, and I'm 89 years old, and um, life goes on. So, any questions? I'll be willing to answer you.